Hi, this is Mitch Harris from Brave the Cold and Napalm Death, and you're listening to the Metal Teddy Bear Experience. The Metal Teddy Bear Experience has begun. And welcome back to the Metal Teddy Bear Experience podcast right now. This is your host. We got my boy, Jesse. What's up, dude? Yo, what's up, guys? How's it going? And we have a special guest today. You might know him as the guitarist in Napalm Death, but today he's talking about his new project, Brave the Cold. What's up, Mitch Harris? How are you doing? Pretty good. Out here in Vegas. It's kind of sunny in the day, but it gets below 32 at night. So Jeez. it would snow if we had some rain. Yeah, we we had um well we didn't have it that bad where we live. I think we almost hit a foot, right, Jess? A foot. Yeah. Yeah, they were like, yeah, they were talking about, it, but then like following some bands that live in like upstate New York or like Boston and stuff, people were just taking pictures of their car completely submerged in snow. I was like, Oh wow, we didn't have it bad at all. I'll take this any day. <laughs> yeah. No, I got a picture today from my friend in Rochester. Oh and, god. Uh, literally, you could see, yeah, there was two foot. Uh, so he must have shoveled out in front of his house. He was there with a brave pull out, and he's like, "I'm brave." Hope he didn't have to scoop it out. Right. Yeah, I made that oh, same man. that same pun too when I was listening to it. I'm like, "Oh, brave the cold right now!" And I walked outside with my shovel, <laughs> with my well, That's where I got the name. Actually, it was like Christmas Eve, and I went out for some milk, and then we had the sideway raining wind, and I was like, "Oh man, it's time to brave the cold." And I was like. Oh, that's a good song title for this one thing. And then when it came to like, I need a name for a band, I was like, let me think. I'm, I have no idea anymore. There's so many bands. What's available? What's been done? And I was like, how about a title that I've had? I went through titles in my head of old Napalm Records or Righteous Day or whatever, you know, something logical. And I was like, oh, how about a title I haven't used? Brave the Cold. Like, that's kind of cool. But then it seemed like a mouthful. But it, then I was like, once you get used to it, it kind of flows off the tongue. It is and a good it, name. Uh, it is, like yeah. It. Were you working? Uh, were you planning on working on something with Dirk before that? Dirk from Megadeth, or um, did you come up with the name first and then hit him up? Um, I had the name, and I'll talk about Dirk in a sec because I just had a, I just remembered something. So, and you know, obviously, I get tired of writing "Break the Cold," so it was like BTC, and uh, plus the old hardcore style thing, and I was like, oh my god, it's Bitcoin. <laughs> if you google btc you're gonna get like bdc to usd twenty thousand usd i'm like that's crazy and you know it had a lot to do with cryptocurrency and sort of uh decentralization so i was like that's a coincidence i like them little things you know yeah, so anyway, cool. as for dirk you know we've been friends over the years met him at some shows and uh he was like always like a massive true fan of like anything involving napalm or any kind of extreme music so when i did you know met him he was just like always like really happy and excited and enthusiastic and he had some questions which is i love when people get into details they might say oh i feel like a fanboy it's like <laughs> no you're talking about the finer details of things you know like that i notice when uh, about production or like that little screech right there on the left speaker of south of heaven <laughs> You know, so anyway, so, you know, we exchanged emails and like every once in a while, he'd be like, hey, man, how's it going? You know, checking in on me when I stopped touring with Napalm to come and help my parents. And, uh, you know, I was like, oh, man, I'm still working on stuff behind the scenes. How's things? He's like, oh, I just joined Megadeth. I was like, whoa, that's awesome. Yeah, that's- <laughs> so then he came to town and we hung out. Um, I went to see, you know, I was already working on stuff, trying to imagine what drummer I'd love to work with that can play the variation of stuff, you know, it's physically demanding. There's stuff that, you know, most drummers could play, but then the, the, the super fast parts or whatever, but um, knowing his history. And then when I saw him with Megadeth, I was like, man, that's so good, dude. He's, and Dave Mustaine looks so happy. He's <laughs> yeah. so confident yeah. with this guy right behind him. He's rocking it. And it was just great. And uh, so I was like, man, I'm doing this. I got a bunch of songs. And if you'd want to play on a couple, you know, He's like, send as much as you can. And I sent him like 40 songs. Some were just a mess. Others were like more structured. And he chose 12. I was like, whoa, okay. okay. So, you know, it's not like, hey, let's do an album together. It's like, if you'd play on a song, you know, it's a lot to ask for anybody these days when you're busy. Yeah. So he, uh, yeah, he chose 12 songs. And some of them went back to like 96 that I wrote. And others were like something fresh that I just wrote. So, um, I was like, interesting, really? You like that one? But <laughs> so he kind of helped it take shape of the direction of the band, you know, by uh, just his choice of songs, really. 
some had drum machine patterns, ideas, and others had just guitar scratch, not even to a click, you know, it was just, you get it, you know what to do. And yeah, yeah <laughs> we didn't have to talk about that part. He was just excited. So he was like, okay, I got some time off. Why don't we spend like three days in the studio in LA? Unfortunately, my mom had died about six weeks before. And, uh, and she was that. like, it wasn't her dying wish or anything, but she was like, you know, I want you to do Brave the Cold and Napalm. You know, just do it. I want you to get back to at least making music. And she's like, at one point, I want you to tour Menace. You have to tour Menace. That's the thing. I can't believe people didn't. You got to get out there and, and we'll make it work. And, you know, so she believed and she was kind of upset that I put life on hold, but I have no regrets. So anyways, I went to L.A., uh, North Hollywood, uh, his friend's studio. And uh, he was from Brazil, Adair. And he was just super excited about the music. He's like, whoa, that's got that old school vibe and energy, but modern. And so, yeah, we did the uh, 12 songs in three days. And then I'm like, we had four days booked that that night. I'm like, let's do these tomorrow, man. And uh, <laughs> so he learned them on the, on the spot. Well, he learned everything on the spot. It was all spontaneous. The way I write is spontaneous. The way we recorded is spontaneous. It was like, you know, first time ever played. So that's where the magic is there. Okay, you know, you could get it better. This could be better. Who cares? The energy is there. And he was so excited, man, just smiling the whole time, having fun. I'm like doing this with my arms. And just like, just <laughs> here, the cymbal breaks there, and we're just cracking up. And uh, yeah, so then I took the, the drums home and recorded it at a studio in Vegas, Tone Factory, which my friends had built over the years, and they had lots of gear. And, and they were also excited too. They're like, whoa, you know, finally, a, you know, a real metal guitar tone or whatever. I bought this Mesa Boogie for the recording. And uh, yeah, did that there, did the bass at home, did some vocals there. And then I realized um, Logan Mater was living here. Um, and we were friends since the first Machine Head tour with Obituary and Napalm. And uh, little did I know that that guy is like a mastermind of production. I mean, I worked with Russ Russell a lot in England and he was like the fifth Beatle, you know? Anything you bring to him, he's part of the journey. He makes it sound great. And then in Vegas, it's kind of, it's always been difficult to find a studio that gets it, you know? It's yeah. not easy kind of music to mix. And, uh, and it makes sound good and modern and stuff. I didn't want an old school. The music's old school enough with a modern twist, but it still has to sound modern. I, and I don't yeah. want it to sound, I don't know. Digital? O overly, you know, yeah. a lot of bands use the same drum sounds, the same Kemper guitar sound. And you'll get a producer that gets a magic formula and he'll run it across 10 bands. And before you know it, it's like, you know, it gets old, but it, it is what it is. But I still wanted it to be organic somehow. He's a great drummer. I want it to feel real. And Logan did a great job of pulling everything out. And uh, Lo Logan's gets, great. Oh, thanks. It gets hard for drums once you get four guitar tracks. And everything's on maximum velocity, you know, the vocals, everything. It's like, and the drums start to disappear a lot. So it's, you know, how to balance it and make it sound right. But Logan did great. Also helped me with some vocal, you know, I was like, this style or this, I'm going to try both. And you let me know which sounds better because I can't make my mind up here. I like both, but, and he'd be like, they sound good both together. I'm like, I know, but I don't want 10 vocal tracks to make one voice on the whole album. So we need to, you know, break it up, low or high here, just to give it dynamics. It's like, okay, low's here, mix these here. And so that was, you know, you need that help. I mean, when you're writing everything, most of everything and all the lyrics and all the vocals, and it's just, it's a lot to, you have to make a decision on the spot. Time is money, get it done. And so, you know, when you get advice from somebody who's also heard music evolve over the years and uh, yeah, so his uh, pointers came in and he, I was like, what's your favorite song, by the way, if you have one? <laughs> He's like, I like Monotheist. I was like, oh, cool. He's like, yeah, of course, it's got this thing, man. It's like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, it's got that Celtic Frost end bit and stuff. So, okay, cool. I, good to know. <laughs> well, do you have a problem? Because you said, uh, like, some of the songs that you sent to Derek were, like, from, like, like way back in the day, like, 90s and, like, early 2000s and whatnot. Do you, like like you said, you're writing everything by yourself. Did you have a problem along the writing process of the entire time, like to just make a decision, like you said, or did you did it all come down in the studio, just be like, oh, this, this, and this, or were you able to control the? Uh, I want to change this. Now I want to change it again. Now I want to change it again. Did, were you able to control that? Or yeah, I mean, I the way I work though, I mean, it's usually the most important thing. I mean, obviously, I I have all these parts, and it's like 
you know, you get some bands that have 13 parts in a song, you know, yeah. which we do have one song like that because it was written like that on the spot. But um, I like when there's a good solid three or four parts, it's memorable and the structure. I love the Beatles as a kid. The structure, the help is probably the most punk song ever. It's got your verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, double chorus, bridge, <laughs> double chorus, end in a minute and a half. That's brutal. Yeah. <laughs> their whole career lasted eight years and look at how they changed it. Yeah, so they it's like okay that if you can structure is so important so the songs were structured to a point i mean subject to change because when it comes to vocals you might think you had it right and then it's like it's just non-stop vocals man it's like yeah. that annoys me too i want to give space for the riff you know we, we got to get the horns up or whatever or something <laughs> introduce the part and then sing so sometimes you got to add a few parts and when you're not uh, done with the lyrics yet, it's like, thankfully, technology, we can just like uh, just grab this here and make it look like we played it that amount of times. And just, you know, once you get the guitars, you, know, you can cut bits out. And so, I mean, not in the olden days, you had to cut the reels and all yeah. that crap. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh, oh, sorry. I used technology to an advantage. I cheated. I admit <laughs> it. But, you know, it's got to be right, man. If you can fix it, do it. It's, the most important thing is that the song makes sense and that the vocals add something to it. You know, somehow a dynamic that, you know, complements the music and not just overtakes the music as well. So there was that. And uh, yeah, it's like there were songs that had no drums. Um, just it wasn't even played to a click. It was a freaking nightmare to remember or work out. But it's not like I didn't even have to get behind the drum kit once and show Dirk what beat I had in mind because he just knows. And that's a rare thing because a lot of times it's an, a weird riff or a strange timing. I could play a little bit of drums. So I'd be like, oh, it's this, it's a three, four, or it's a seven or something and show them this thing. And, and sometimes it might take someone a long time to grasp it as well, what it is, or, you know, that's what jamming's all about. But man, we didn't, he just knew. I was like, okay, this is a weird riff. Show me where the resolve is, which what I mean is where <laughs> the riff actually repeats itself. He's like, there, I was like, dude, that's magic. I mean, I'm mad. <laughs> you know, I don't have to say, and he's just enjoying every minute of it. So, which is great. You know, there's no tension. I mean, obviously we want to get it done and he wants to perform as best he can. But uh, for me, I was like, dude, you don't realize how good this is, man. <laughs> how did it feel to have like a, just a, like a force like that? Cause like every, there's a lot of good drums out there, but there's very few, like just guys that can just run in and just destroy like 12 songs in no time and just make it sound like they've been working on it for like a year or so. <laughs> like yeah. there's just so many, like Derek is one of those guys. Like he just like, so glad he got into Megadeth because people finally see how good he is. But it's just like that guy's just so goddamn good, like you said. How to feel working with a guy like that? Yeah, he's not like. I mean, some people might see him as a studio guy, but he literally he gets it. He when he hears something, he he's got a whole vision for it, and like he can understand where it came from, where it needs to go, and what he could add. He, he's not like a overly flashy drummer where he's like a he's technically like a super progressive dude but he doesn't it's not about showing off it's about solid beats and like a tasty fill at the end so he knows that that's like instinct you know you'll, you'll get a lot of guys that'll be like yeah i could play that whatever and and not even they'll do it as a favor or like not <laughs> feeling it and living and breathing it and like excited you know i mean some yeah, people might be like oh it's an opportunity to work from this dude from a band and get excited about that but the actual songs uh it's feeling for him and it's you know it comes from years of just being a fan of so many bands that he just knows it and i'll be like you know like a sodom beat brr, 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 and he knows exactly what i mean i'll be like you know like that old uh read saint mark tribal thing like celtic frost he's like i get it you know what you mean we don't even have to say so it's like yeah tele telepathy yeah. telepathical well, there's sometimes like uh you know you hear bands uh when they do like their little projects or whatnot they'll use like a drum machine or something. Did that ever cross your mind or you knew that you're like, I'm going to have a, a real drummer on this? Well, um, I usually, a lot of times I'll uh, work with drum machine. I have my old Roland R8 drum machine, which Danny Lilker showed me how to program back in 92. So when I get a little more serious about a song, sometimes I'll write spontaneous patterns and who cares and just jam over that and, um, and then just work with that super simple the same drum fill whatever so um a lot of bands use easy drummer and there, there's modern software that can make it sound great and but you know 
when it's done. It's like you, you get this super fast, humanly impossible double bass and blast beats or whatever. <laughs> it's like, it's so perfect that, I don't know, I, I find the human ear likes this natural organic thing. Maybe they like the drum machine sounds, but the, the real playing is what breaks it up. And the, you yeah. know, when the sound is consistent, it just blurs into the mix. You don't, nothing stands out. There's no changes in volume or dynamics, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to working on a drum machine album. And then you get a drummer who could play to a click and better that or whatever, add some real symbols to make it real. But the fact of having Dirk there with real, you know, humanly played stuff. Yeah. And if you can mix some modern sounds in there just to bolster it up, then that's great. It's like, keep it organic as possible is the goal, but still wants to sound fresh and hard hitting with all the balls you can give me. <laughs> Well, yeah, a lot of my favorite bands that, like, started as, like, like, there was this wave of, like, bands who started in their bedroom, and because of Easy Drummer and all these things, they were able to make a lot of music, and, like, those first, like, album or two albums were very digital, and, like, they were good live, but, like, on the album, like, I liked the song, but it wasn't always the best, and then, like, the second or third album comes out, and they started working in, like, the studio with real amps and real drums, it's, like, yeah, no, I like that first sound, I like those songs, but, man, it's so nice when, like you said, when you get that natural, you feel like someone's actually there playing it, and you're, like, oh man you don't have to wait live to hear like the better version of it where you're like yeah. okay nice like some bands like all the gent stuff like the heavy parts yeah. don't really yeah. hit yeah they don't hit on the album but like everyone wants to be mashuga and stuff <laughs> but like when you go live it's like oh there's the bass there and it's there's the breakdowns and stuff it's like nice it's like and then oh, when they all drummer, start acoustic the stuff, drummers like, like the real deal but you know you'll get guys that they'll do, have done that they got an album out and they got on the tour and they got a real drummer and then after a while, they're like, man, we got to, everyone says, it sounds so much better with a real drummer. Make sure to use that guy live on the next record. And, you know, if they can get along together and feel the vibe yeah. and write together, you know, so, I mean, Drum Machine is really good for writing and arranging songs and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, you could do an amazing album like that, all Drum Machine, and be like, hold on, let me just call Gene Holland real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gene's the man. Yeah. So, you know, there's that. But, uh, you know, who knows where music's going? I mean, and most bands are... I mean, you got to cut corners. You don't want to spend 20, 30 grand making a record, even if it's your fifth album, most anticipated album. You you do as much as you can at home to just so you can get in the studio and nail it. Time is money. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and to pay for someone that can make it sound great as well. You know, there's a lot of up and coming guys, but, uh, you know, they use the same old tricks, man. It's like, come on. <laughs> when you get like, in, like the old days, like the first defecation album was done in three days. Damn. I think it cost 350 bucks or something like that. <laughs> And, uh, your day. You capture the drummer, you run through all the songs, you do all the vocals, you do all the guitars and bass and whatever, and you mix it in a day and it's done. It's like nothing has changed. Yeah. If it sounds good to begin with, it should be straightforward, but yeah. it gets a lot more anal as you go and everyone has their own system, but uh, you know, I'm somewhere in between. If I could get a drummer that can knock it out, then yeah. And if it takes time, it doesn't matter. As long as you get along and everyone's into it, man, whatever it takes. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah some bands i've some bands even left and i've heard some like the band they just like put the guy's part in because like we like that guy but we don't want to find it because there's like those <laughs> two years where everyone was fighting and we finally got the core group it's like we'll just put it over the top we don't need another cut because it's like they just started all the fighting it's like damn it's like i was like all right i kind of i like live music but it's like sometimes i'm like yeah, I never thought about that as like a as a bystander. You're like, yeah, please play my favorite song. And it's like all the fighting that must go on in the van or the bus or whatever. It's just like, oh yeah, no, they're people. I forgot for some reason. I don't know why I didn't think yeah. about that. <laughs> oh, with Napalm especially, it was always a case of, I mean, each member had their favorite songs from a record, but it's like, as a fan of the band, you gotta, you expect the classics. I mean, what are the classics? You got your first three albums, basically, Harmony, Utopia as well, you know. Um, a little bit of each. And when you get to your 13th, 14th album, you're like, hold on. If we play <laughs> one song off each record, and then, you know, you want to play at least six new songs, but people are like yawning almost like, ah, I don't know this one. I can't wait to hear stuff for the children or scum or something. So it's like, it's hard, man. And a lot of times you do an album and you tour that cycle and you never play half the stuff live. And before you know it, you've got a whole discography of songs you never played. And people say, I'd love to have seen that live but it's like sometimes there's songs that just feel good live they're not yeah. too hard to play i like to run around crazy and like this part has a good you know slow part for the, this reaction and it's got the fast for the intensity you break it up and before you know it though it feels like you wasted a lot of 
I mean, I would love to go out, like say Brave the Cold, for example, were the tour now. We would literally play the entire first album and that would be a set. And then you would get to see every song. Yeah. And then as you get to the second record, you're like, ah, we dropped that one. <laughs> we dropped that one too. That was a pain in the ass, man. You know? So <laughs> as it goes, you know, whatever. It's, it's still a visual when people hear it. They can imagine what it would be like life. And that's as far as it goes now. That's all we have. It was like a Mastodon. I feel like every time they toured, they, uh, like the first, when they put out an album, they would do like that whole album, basically the whole album, and like three or four, you know, of their well known songs like Blood and Thunder. And then the yeah. next tour cycle, they would be like an all mix of everything. I think Iron Maiden does that too. They do like a throwback set, and then the next one is like the new album. Yeah. No, it's good. There's different ways of doing it, but in the kind of music we play, once you reach the 45 minute point, I mean, if a crowd is super active, and, you know, we, we're quite active on stage. It's like uh, after 40, you can see a dip, man. People are tired. I need a beer. I need a weed. And it's just like, okay, but it drops. And then it's like you got that little hot. The, it's just going downhill, dude, from where I'm standing. You know, yeah. if the crowd is losing energy, it's time to call it a day. So, you know, an hour 15 max. But you get other bands that are progressive and it's not about that. Like Rush, you know, I'd probably watch a three-hour set. But, um, you know, or I'd go see a classic band from the 80s and they would play their new album and stuff. And it's like an hour into it. Then they play all the old classics. I'm like, I'm sorry, but I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. it sounds like you used to. It's like you're on fire, but the songs all kind of sound like the old stuff, but it's not. And it goes, it's got that thing. But and I yeah. know you want to promote your new album, but I'm bored. And sometimes I left. And they were like, man, they just played all the classics at the end. I was like, I'm over it, dude. <laughs> Sorry. Not, not a $15 of beer. Shit. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it gets crazy. crazy. You drink one, you're like, I'll only drink one. And then like 58 like $60, you're like, fuck. Dude, they were talking <laughs> like, about well, now. They're like, uh, with everything being closed, is all the prices are going to go up for like beer and food and all that so they can recoup all the money they lost. And I was like, oh, my God, how can you go higher than a $15 beer? <laughs> yeah. You got Mandalay Bay out here, but you know, the House of Blues prices. People be like, hey, come down. I got you on the list. Free show. I'm like, dude, I spend 150 bucks every time I go out. <laughs> yeah. You get a round for somebody, you're like, ouch. Yeah. 50 yeah. bucks. Hey, where did he go? Where did that motherfucker go? <laughs> 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 He's in the mush. Pit. Yeah. Okay. That's why I used to do a Terminal 5. The bar's right in the, the door as you walk into yep. the, the opening. And I would be like, uh, double Tito's, be like 18, 20 bucks. I'm like, <sighs> all right <laughs> and i'm just like i gotta drink more though like two hours later i'm like oh, i'm down 100 oh my god stop going to the bar <laughs> just sit in the middle well get a shirt first and then yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i always do well that's the thing too it's like and then i'm like it's a good shirt though that's why i'm happy when bands have shitty merch my god i can save my money Oh, because <laughs> i want to give bands money but sometimes it's like I don't know what it is. Some bands just have really bad merch where I'm like, oh, can you have a CD? And then, cause like you said, they don't even like sell CDs sometimes. Cause like no one has a fucking CD player. I'm like, Oh my God, let me give you money. And <laughs> I, I once threw 20 bucks in the tip jar. I was like, I don't really like anything, but here's money. I'm just like, fuck. Oh, that's good. Dude. Once we played in Atlanta, Georgia at the masquerade and like this guy, I was putting my stuff away from this, you know, my pedals, whatever. And this guy comes up to me, Hey, Hey, come here, man. I want to give you a tip. I'm like, what? I shook his hand. I'm like, what? Are you, what? <laughs> he was like, here, man. Thanks for changing my life. And I was like, what? I swear, I can almost cry. But, but uh, he gave me a hundred bucks. Damn. Damn. And I was man. like, what are you doing? No, dude, I can't take this. He's like, you have to take this, dude. You've dedicated your life to this. You've changed the life of many people. I don't, I have every shirt, every album I'll ever need. I just want you to have this. And I was just like, I swear, dude. I'm still like taken back by that. Well, that's amazing. We didn't that's do awesome. money. It had nothing to do with money. It was like change the world, first band on the moon type of stuff. Whatever yeah. it takes, we'll get by. And then it gets harder as you go, you know. But uh, forget that, dude. That's why I always like always hate about like especially people that dislike because uh, it's like all music has effects on people. And but then it's like is like fans of extreme music, you know. Especially when you're in like the middle school and high school, people always like trash like oh you like that screaming stuff it's like yeah it fucking gets me through some tough times or sometimes <laughs> you're just like yeah it feels amazing like dude there's been plenty of times i've been in a very not so great mood and put on some of my favorite heavy tunes i'm like yeah i feel pretty good i think i might actually go do something instead of sit and wallow under a cloud or something and like yeah, you know i mean in fact that's been the most 
rewarding thing of anything I've ever done. I mean, I swear, sometimes I look back like a failure, you know, I came yeah. home, but to help my parents, you know, but like with my tail between my legs, starting from scratch with nothing. But then I meet people and they say like, you can help get me through the darkest of times, man. And like, or like a lifestyle, a way of thinking that like we had something in common. We spent our youth together. We were kids, man. You know, 16, yeah. 15, I started my first band. 19, I was already living in England, you know, alone. And these people kind of forget that. We grew up together, you know, and not just what we did, but all the bands around us that we, we were all, you know, our youth is gone. But I still feel that we're in our prime in a position to change things for the better. But when you meet somebody that is, you know, that might not be here today, if it wasn't for music, it's like, okay, you know, you may, everyone has hard times and thank God there's music. And it's not just this kind of music, it's music in general. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's like our content, um, the amount of content we put out as well, it was like probably more than most bands as well. So it gave them something to look forward to each year and a place to go. And you'd go to Germany and you'd meet these 15 people that travel to every show. And then when you're in Japan, these people travel to every show. And suddenly these people from Japan are in Germany and you hook them up with those guys and then they're all together, you know, showing them around. And it's like, wow, these people have met because of us or someone proposed to each other on stage because they met at a show or just the little things that would have never happened if I didn't break my foot that day and then <laughs> play guitar and then I would have never moved to England and then my kids would have never been here and then everything would have been different. The, the butterfly effect thing. So yeah. yeah, I could talk forever about it, but there is real meaning, especially when you believe in what you do and there's a passion and a vision. It's like, it brings people together. I mean, we fought long and hard. I mean, most people I knew hated my music, but they're like, he's a nice guy though, you know? <laughs> it's like, I didn't do it for my friends or what they liked, I did it for what I liked. And eventually, love it or hate it, we won people over by pure determination. Will, hard blood, sweat, and beers. Yep. And beers, <laughs> as I've already expressed. <laughs> and I'm an emotional guy, I'm a true romantic, really. But, um, you know, there's a side of me that, I don't know, maybe it was growing up in New York and just watching the evolution of music that just, it always made me feel good to release that energy into recording and on stage and people to watch them give it back. It was like an exchange that just indescribable. Oh, it's the best part of heavy yeah. music. Like I know there's other music with like, where like people tell me like, oh, you know, whatever genre, there's a lot of energy live. I'm like, there might be, but I don't know. There's something about going to see like such a great band live that like, and you're just like, wow, there's just something like, dude, how many, you gotta ask Chris, how many times I'm like, I'm not going to mosh tonight. And then like two songs in, he just turns around. I'm gone. It's like, yeah. I gotta go like duty yeah. calls. I gotta, I gotta punch into the clock, even though I'm like a <laughs> hundred pounds overweight. I'm like, I get tired real quick. <laughs> but he's like, you gotta go. <laughs> a 45 minute cutoff point, man. Yeah. <laughs> to the end. But yeah, I mean, I got hurt plenty of times in the early days, stage dive, tailbone central or just whatever, just nothing but pain the next day. And after a while, I'm like, you know what? I unfortunately I'm the dude that'll watch from the back, you know, or I could be on side of stage and be like, I enjoy watching the crowd more than the band most times. Oh, dude, yeah, I wonder what sorry. people, you know, how their reaction is like, whoa, this band's on fire. People are into this. You know, I judge it by, I'm just a, a weird music police dude. I don't care if a band plays perfectly or not. It's not about that. It's like the push and pull, the give and take, and just the, the re overall response. I watch that to me is entertaining. Oh, you know, well, see yeah. what's coming it's like a futuristic outlook of what's been done what's been achieved what people still love and will always will and what's the next not the big thing but a possible way forward to find an ounce of inspiration from any live show <laughs> from any band yeah yeah that's why i always felt about bands like uh like dillinger escape plan yeah like yeah. some people like uh, you you show someone the ron dillinger song they're like dude that's just noise i'm like but you don't get it bro like you just <laughs> Put it on the car, man. You feel it. And then live, it's just... Texas Chainsaw fucking... Massacre on stage. Yeah, it's fucking brutal. But I don't know what it is about it. I, I don't know human psychology, but when I hear it, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I so love good. about them is the structure. Yeah. The structure's down. They're not super long songs. Innovative chords. It's intense. It's screamed. It's sang. It's yeah. well played. And it's to the point and live. You know, when yeah, I saw that... Like it was more entertaining and brutal than any like of this new the dig gent grunt whatever you want to call it these days the yeah. death metal stuff which is cool if whatever you're into man 
but it's like when you're looking for inspiration um yeah i was like man they get some energy and it just makes you wonder how many you know times they hurt themselves <laughs> but, yeah they destroy themselves on stage as well as their instruments well that's part of the reason why they said they they stopped it's like it's like we're old men. <laughs> it's just like literally. It's like Greg. I think I've seen him jump off like five balconies. Greg like, said he's he could like do how... it today, though, if he wanted to. Well, he's, he's in a... shape. Yeah. But a lot of the other guys, like Ben, I thought he broke his foot the last. I saw. I went to the last show at Terminal yeah. Five, and I, there was a moment where he jumped. I was like, I was like, oh no. <laughs> I was just like, and he was like, seemed fine. I'm like, I wonder if his ankle's all right, bro. But it's like, dude, it's the whole time. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just oh. lose it. And when people don't get it, they're like, why did they do that? I'm like. I don't know. Music makes you do shit, dude. I don't know what to tell you. You just gotta listen. <laughs> I broke my foot once on tour with Nazem and uh, in Europe, three days into a sixty-show tour, oh, and so Damn. I uh, shattered my heel bone. And basically, I was on crutches. I did fifty-six shows on a bar stool, using my left foot on the pedal, still doing vocals, headbanging, whatever. But blah blah blah. The show, yeah, have fun trying to get on this stage with this <laughs> and the different dressing room and that venue. And it was just. A different kettle of fish. Oh, how am I going to take a shower or a bath? And just like things. How am I going to get my luggage upstairs in this little Holland hotel up three flights of stairs and my guitar and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, once you hurt your foot on tour and you realize how easy life was before. Yeah, it's <laughs> hard, man. And yeah, aches and pains. I mean, Napalm on stage, you know, we don't do the Dillinger thing, but there's people on and off grabbing you and like slamming into you. I've been punched in the, the head by in moscow by some dude and someone it's like you gotta watch out for barney behind you sometimes he slams his finger on the guitar you gotta watch my peripheral is insane <laughs> there's always someone coming you don't know yeah, from right. where or what they're gonna do and uh you know you got this 30 pound less paul on you and uh, <laughs> it, it adds up man so uh i don't know can i ask how you, how'd you break your foot <laughs> did you jump off like an amp or something or you just like st fell off something or how'd you break your foot yeah a long story but uh yeah sid barrett stuff you know? <laughs> i fell down some stairs in france when the bus broke down and they ripped the front off the bus trying to tow it and we were uh, not only that um in uh two cars for the rest of the tour jeez and pulling two trailers and uh yeah i had my foot on the dashboard feeling every bump <laughs> jeez, what am Jordan. i gonna do go home yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, imagine yeah, the show's canceled. Why he went home? I don't know. <laughs> he <laughs> he just uh, he just said, uh, "I want to go home," and that was it. Yeah. So I've uh, well, well, we might be back. I don't know. <laughs> just, yeah. That's the end. And yeah, I got home two days before Christmas, and then still had to get Christmas presents. And by then, my it was snowing in England, and my crutches had uh, the rubber broke off it, so it was literally steel. Jesus but that was killer. Dude, it gave me a grip on the snow. Oh, Ice. really? You were just stabbing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we have a we have a little segment we call on our show the the random silly question segment. We ask you three random questions. You ready to take part in this? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Question number one: If you had to make a celebrity zombie apocalypse team, who would you recruit, and where would you guys go? Bjork. We're in Iceland. Uh, Joe Pesci. <laughs> Joe Pesci. Him to see me. <laughs> For walking, uh, Robert De Niro. Wow, I, I want to be in it, of course. Yeah, Danny Looker, uh, Taylor Swift, and Chino from Deftones. This is the all star. <laughs> this is the lineup. Oh, and Shane, we need Shane, <laughs> and Blake, of course. That's awesome. It's like you're almost going to make a record. <laughs> well, you got Bjork and Taylor Swift, you know, they're on opposing teams. I don't know who the good one is or the bad one, but yeah. you know, we'll find out as we go. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I the one I got when I asked this was The Rock, and the the dude from Sons on, Sons on Anarchy, uh, the main oh, guy. Right. Yeah, I thought that was a funny one. I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty good. He's like The Rock. He's like, I don't know. He's six four. I guess he could do something to those zombies. <laughs> right, or and then eventually the king zombie. Like, whoa. Yeah, he becomes a super. Zombie. would have been good too, man. <laughs> I will say the Rock might be a bad choice just because that motherfucker might eat a lot of food, dude. He's six foot four, like almost three hundred <laughs> pounds of muscle. It's like, it's like, dude, he's gonna get hungry eventually, and then you know you find out who he really is. And you're like, oh shit, he wants my fucking mashed potatoes or something, and I can't stop him. <laughs> Hit him with something. <laughs> Survival mode. <laughs> 
Uh, question number two, what was the strangest fan request? Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, I've, you know, most of it's pretty standard. Can you send a pic or a DVD or everything you own to our house? But there's one time we were in Russia um, and we were in Siberia. It was like our third time there. And I don't think it was Novosibirsk. But anyways, we had to go to some signing at a tattoo shop and we had to walk far. And it was, I'm not joking, like 40 below Celsius. Like you could feel the snot freeze in your nose. And, and I was sore too, my ankle was sore. I'm like, man, you gotta be kidding me, whatever. Okay, we get there, you know, of course there's like six people. So, uh, <laughs> but one guy, I mean, first of all, they said free tattoos for the band or whatever, if you want, or the crew. And I, they had good work. So I was like, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about something. And this, this guy comes up, he's like, I want you to tattoo your signatures in my arm. And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> Normally, I'd say no, so no. Um, oh, dude, I'm doing you a favor. Trust me. We, what if we'd come out and make it, you know, a glam record or something? You know, are you sure? Anyways, uh, Barney was like, I'll do it. <laughs> like, yeah. First of all, I was like, I don't even want your blood or whatever. I was like, my handwriting is the worst. Uh, my signature is not much better. Anyways, Barney's like, I'll do it. I don't care um, if it'll make him happy. And he's left handed as well. So, anyways. He was like, just sign the signatures on his arm in the Sharpie and then we will, uh, and I'll tattoo it. And I was like, all right, whatever. So as Barney was doing that, then I was getting some alien tattoo, alien God or holding the Bible or some crap. I showed oh, him. Oh, damn. Something. Nice. Oh. That's cool as hell, actually. Yeah. And that was free? Yeah. but Oh, that's uh, awesome. Literally got it done like 20 minutes before the show, walked back through the snow and ice and then played and it was burning and sizzling. Oh, and, yeah. Oh. Fond memories. So it was like, yeah, I mean, to me, a tattoo is not just a design. It's more like not just also what it means to you personally, but the memory attached to it. I mean, we're, I'm from Las Vegas. We're in Siberia. And then there's the guy <laughs> asking if you get tattooed. I mean, how ridiculous is this? Sound? My kids, they think I'm bullshit. And sometimes when I tell them some stories, <laughs> you know, come on, you know, really, it was 40 below Celsius. You don't know what that feels like. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, dad, you're over exaggerating on me. Honestly, whatever. It's all good. Well, especially if you're from Las Vegas, I can't imagine like this yeah. the, <laughs> the juxtaposition being thrown into Siberia. It's like, oh my god, <laughs> this is literally the opposite. But it's a rocking scene there, man. Nobody yeah. Siberia, there was 900 people. I mean, every Damn. show in Russia is killer, dude. They got the that's best what I heard clubs, best PAs. You know, think about compared to Jacks or somewhere. You know, but whatever. I mean, it's like they take care of you, and the, the people are hungry and excited nobody plays there you go to uh vladivostok was the first show it's like as close as you can get to japan on the other side and it's like is there going to be anybody here and it's like you know 500 people you're like whoa i never even heard of this place before yeah and you learn about Damn. the culture and the lake bacal and all these places the deepest lake on earth and all this stuff you're like whoa and they oh, took damn. you there it's, it's do awesome you, do you get time to like look ice. around um sometimes but not so much yeah. It's, uh, you know, literally they ordered food. You just travel 36 hours on a train to the next town and take all your stuff with you. And it's just hard. And then you get there and they order food for you and then you leave. I, I prefer nightlife, Me going to clubs and meeting people or hanging out with a crowd. That to me is more cultural and rewarding than any museum or whatever. I mean, it's cool to take a picture of the Kremlin or in front of it or whatever, but I don't need a museum really to feel or like architecture is like, I need sleep. <laughs> and I want to hang out with people and see what they're into and you know just I don't know Yeah, it's like that's how you connect and make friends for life I see I never see people as fans I see as friends for life that we shared a journey together you know oh, that's awesome. whatever country they get upset like I wish my English was better because they have this detailed the poetry in every language of what they really want to say and it's I mean I say your English is perfect man to me I understand what you mean and they just look at you man in this way Hold your hand, hold your hands, shake your hand in a way. <laughs> like, just hold your hand. The yeah, look. Lucky for the I used to say to my mom, that napalm look where they just look and they just say, you know, That's like awesome. they, can't, they don't have the words, but you, I just don't look. It. I've been there, dude. That's awesome. That's the best part of like, like when watch any band DVDs or anything, when they go to like, like in like South America or deep into Europe, like Russia, and you just see like some of the crowds, you're like, dude, uh, yeah, some shows are crazy over here, but nothing compared to people that don't get bands maybe like all year maybe for two years they may have band like like their favorite band tours like they're every four or five years or something it's like 
holy yeah. shit, we actually got the band here. And they just fucking like, was it South America? Like a few bands like, yeah, I thought they were going to foot the bus in excitement. They didn't hate us. <laughs> they were like, we love you so much. And then they just say, so yeah, we almost flipped. They almost flipped it. This is like out of happiness. It was like, that's a weird feeling. We had that in Mexico City once. But, um, but the thing is, I mean, given the nature of our age and the evolution of music and when it started and, you know, there was like, I mean, even as a kid growing like an America, a U.S. tour was like an uncontrollable dream. Like you touring Europe. I mean, you would never think of Russia. But the thing, what, the point I'm trying to get to is we were on the crest of a wave of it, things opened up. We got to Russia and communist Russia, 91 and uh, or yeah, 92 ish. And the, it's like the first man on the moon, dude. It's like you know, all the propaganda we had here growing up, Red Dawn and Fear Nuclear War and DRI lyrics, you can't make me go to war, blah, 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 blah. And it's like to wonder, like, are they as scared as us, uh, scared of us as we are of them? Or are yeah. they as, as curious as of us as we are of them? And like, Brits hate Americans or whatever, the, these myths. And you get to meet these people and they're just nothing but friendly and inquisitive and great questions of what's it like? I mean, Vegas, what are you doing here? What are you kidding me? But you, to be like the first band to actually do, I mean, bands played in Brazil, you know, Sao Paulo or whatever, but we did the first extensive tour in South America. It was uncharted territory and like South Africa and uh, uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, or like when uh, Kazakhstan, and you wake up and they slip a newspaper under your door and you're on the cover of the newspaper. It's like, we, but it's, <laughs> you know, so the excitement, so basically it, it happened. There's a promoter there and it was legit and everything was fair and it happened. And now they want to bring another band because they're like, holy shit, two nights at 9,000 people in Moscow. Yes, we want more bands. We played for free. It was 50 cents a ticket, which was probably like a week's wages in their currency. But then when we first played in China, due to expenses and flights or whatever, it was $20 a ticket. I was expecting a big crowd, but you'd have like 250 people in Beijing. You know, the metal market is not, but it's the cost. It's like, I would prefer to play for free in a place like that. You know, yeah. it's about reaching people, yeah. impact on their life, a memory. You know, it's like, I don't need to come home with anything for something like that and experience. But when you're the first band, whatever. the long story short is, it opens up for other bands and more bands go there. So the second time we'll play, they'll be like, it went from 9,000 to 3,000, which is still awesome. But you're like, okay, I can see that they're, it's oversaturated now and people not just, okay, that that uh, special moment is over the first time, you know, and then they either can't afford it or, you know, they, they had their, you know, their fill on the first time and it's, it's not, it's just spoiled for choice. Like you get a place like, Germany, which has every band going through it in Munich and Frankfurt and uh, Stuttgart and Berlin and whatever. And it's yeah. like, if you're on your own, if you don't have a strong package in a place like that with three bands that you just can't miss this show, it's not going to be busy. Man. It doesn't matter how good your album is. I mean, they're like, Napalm, we've seen them 30 times already. I want to go see this thing. Or I've seen them on every festival last summer. So it's tricky. Yeah, when you're spoiled, like, you know, New Jersey, probably less show. Yeah, but it's not that far to Manhattan. Where well, yeah, New York, clearly, we're like 30 minutes away, maybe 20 minutes yeah. away from New York. And there's nights, literally, a night where I wanted to go see three shows. I just, like, like banger shows. I'm like, oh, my God, like, this is a problem to, like, to have to choose of three great shows. I'm like, what a problem to have. And I was just like, and I knew someone at another show, and I knew someone at the other show. And they're like, it was great. I'm like. Well, you just had to you just had to pick at this point. It's like, dude, what and then other people like I had to drive five fucking hours to go see one show. It's like, yeah, there, there's there it sucks to live next to a city like that big sometimes and there's great things about it, but man, sometimes we'll shows, see bands three times in one year. Like we saw Heaper three times and then Trivium too. Like you'll see these bands come because you know, big markets New Jersey and New York, we get to see them both. Yeah, and it's a good problem to have. It's a great well, a great problem to have. It's just like but it's gnarly. At least you yeah. can park in Jersey. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the city. Yeah, no, I take a bus at any time, even though it <laughs> sucks for like two hours just sitting there and listen to people fart and burp and sneeze. It's like, ah yeah. oh, man, at least I'm at the park, <laughs> just sit there fighting cabs. Totally. No, if I had to choose, like you got three, I'd be like, all right, if I got to choose between BB Kings or the Gramercy, I'm gonna hit the Gramercy. Or if you had to choose between CBGBs or uh, Coney Island High or whatever, you know, you got or. Uh, Wow, limelight, or you know, I'm gonna go where the best experiences. Yeah, yeah, like, too. 
yeah, okay, it's cool, but the bouncers suck, and it's always <laughs> tech, and they play, they kick you out. There's no other part. It's like a nightmare, you know. So I, it's the venue, yeah. and like where my buddy's gonna be. I could care less about the bands at this point. Man. Like, they're all <laughs> yeah. friends, and you know, a lot of times you won't even get to say hi because of the nature of just how it is, you know. Yeah, like, man, I only went to say hi, but it just didn't work out because House of Blues security was so whatever, and it's like, you know. Yeah, some I'm, some venues are crazy like that, like. It's just not nothing. Almost no fun zone. Just orange shirts and lights in your face. With the fucking strobe light flashlight. You're like, what the fuck? Yeah. House of rules. <laughs> and like, uh, you know, great sound and stuff. I mean, yes. It's been experience. Didn't uh, B- didn't the yeah didn't that close down now? BB King. That, yeah. BB King's closed down. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Gospel yeah. brunch. I remember that. Love I got it. to see it one time. I got to go there one time, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Like, this is amazing. And then it closed down. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I was like, what a great venue. <laughs> yeah, like, it was pretty That awesome. was weird, though, the layout. It's not ideal. The long stage and then the speakers were, like, almost on top. Always sound issues. Yeah. Whatever. I don't want to. It's all fun memories, man. <laughs> At least there was a place. A lot of times you need a, a city that has a, a 300, 400 capacity room, and you need a place with a 1,200 capacity room, and that's it. But a lot of times you don't have that smaller club. It sucks playing a big club when there's only when there's only four or five hundred people that's great but it looks empty and the sound sucks because it's just echoey so uh, you know vegas doesn't really have that 350 there's one place downtown which is good and it's tight yeah. you got to be squished together man to make it work yeah and also especially with extreme music you get that pit that opens up and then just stays open for the rest of the show and yeah. it's just like the size of the room and you're like oh man it's just awkward when there's like the other two guys mosh in the center it's like yeah, maybe it could have did a smaller room. I don't know. They fuck, it's like, what happened? It's like, shit. Let's hope it returns to that, though. The agent, just takes, the agent takes the bigger fee, and the band's like, why didn't we play that place? You know, too yeah. Late now. Should have yeah. been more involved. <laughs> <laughs> or choosing the right local bands is also great to make sure, because these guys are excited. They play with all those other bands, and they push the hell out of the show more than anybody. You got to. I mean, we did some really successful tours where it was just us and locals, but we chose the locals by, you know, knowing like this band Trap Them is good. And like these guys on the West Coast or whatever, they work the shows and they eat shit, dude. They travel in a van and nationwide and they, they believe in it, you know, goat whore and bands like that. They worked it. And, and it's like, you know, you get the right band and uh, it works both ways. You know, it helps them and they help us. And that's what you do. It's the long vision, man. Yeah. The metal tour. You signed up for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true, man. It's it's a, it's it's funny when people talk about some music. Like, oh, that's a big band, or like the people. Like, I saw you on TV or something. Like, they expect you to have a lot of money. It's like, oh man, nah. <laughs> it's like, nah. It's it's a great time. I'm happy, but it's like, you know, they deceive bands. But it's like that's why you try to buy merch, like you said, or hell, like I said, even if I don't like the merch, give the tips and stuff because you just got to keep these people going. You know, keep you guys going. Yeah. Like the new record, you know, I braved the cold, man. This is like scarcity. It was really good. It's just like I want more of that. That's why I want. I don't have the most money in the world, but it's like, yeah, <laughs> just gotta keep it coming. Yeah. Well, there's an EP that'll be out at some point because it was too. Like, we might have mentioned that earlier. Yeah, we heard- track for the the uh, people with a very short term memory loss at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. It'll just branch it out. Maybe we'll do a gatefold with, that has everything on it. Who knows? With the DVD of all the videos. With the EP, is it like how much, is it just, it's just an extension of it or is there any like different feeling when it comes to the EP or is it just, we have all these extra songs, we're just going to release an EP? Um, It's, I wouldn't say some of my lesser favorite songs. I prefer straight up rock and tunes. It just covers all the bases and, you know, but then there's like one song, which is five or six minutes, which was written. I'm pretty empty songs like that that have like 12 parts. It's technically two songs in one. It's got a lot of uh, weird clean vocals and scream and whatever, blast beats and everything. But it was written on the spot like that spontaneous. So I try to do it as it happened, you know, instead of switching it into two songs. Um, I mean, I wish that would have been on the record, but it, it would have threw people for real. You know, like some people like meat and potatoes and that's it it's like straight yeah. up sliced and diced i'm glad the first album is straightforward but there's another song actually the title track um it's not my favorite song of the record but it's out there more in the voivod out there trippy shit um progressive but noisy um and then there's one 
like a Swansea type of thing. Like napalm has these, you know, slow removed, painful, call it, they, some would say industrial, but that's all clean vocals. So before you know it, if you rearrange the album, people are like, I don't know if it's menace or what. The <laughs> so if we held these songs off and the way we broke it up with two middle songs, it, it shows signs of a progression. And it's also deep, dark and mysterious. So um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'm not expecting a miracle when it comes out. It's all part of the same vision, but it definitely would have made, maybe some people would have liked the album more because it had that extra scope. But yeah. you know, that's the kind of thing, once a band progresses, I mean, give some room to progress. You know, you don't have to show all your cards in the first 30 minutes. It's like, that's only Peter North does that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So when do you think the album will come out or the EP? Yeah, I don't know. There's still three videos to come, Sweet. which uh, I would prefer to see leave that till next year did it's you like, edit them all um yeah all of them except for one that the director i knew he had two videos that i used in his one and there was a copyright issue with another dude so he he did the last one himself um apparatus this italian guy and dano and he's he just awesome dude and he was super excited he's like it's like they were made for each other <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but I did all the other edits, basically searched for weeks and found footage that seemed to be uh, coherent with the theme. Um, also a different angle of the message sometimes, like, oh, I never thought of that. But the way that landed right there and I said that, it's all about the lyrics. It's like, to me, there's a story in the lyrics, there's a story um, in the video and they complement each other. Instead of just us thrashing around on stage, people stage diving on people's heads you know, some zombie in the corner. It's like, come on, man. I've seen it all before. I like storytelling. And um, yeah, so the next three are equally as good. Um, animated, all different kinds of styles. And I basically did the editing. Um, I think I did like 19 videos in a row. Over Damn. Like, I don't know, in about three weeks. And then I was like, I really like this one. I'm getting too attached to this one. And then I'd be like, okay, who did this again? And I'd find it because I, I took notes on it. Okay, let me contact this guy. He's in, this guy's in Japan. This guy's in Russia. This guy's in Bulgaria. This guy's in Italy. This guy's in London. This guy's in England. And uh, half of them wrote back and they were like, you know, I'm like, we're struggling artists, you know, just trying to get a message across. And hopefully we can set, put a link to drive traffic to your other work. Maybe you'll get some video. And they were like, yeah, you have my blessing. So basically, yeah, I'm sure they spent, I mean, one of them spent six years on a video and other six months and, you know, it ain't cheap when you hire 16 people on animation. It's a different world. And, you know, some of these videos had like 19 million views already. We'll put it out and get 2,500 clicks. I'm like, really, dude? <laughs> you know, <laughs> me. How about, I should wear a shirt that says click me, please. <laughs> please click, click me. me. <laughs> yeah. But whatever, man. It, in the long term, it's the vision that matters. It's the message. It's not a concept album. It's like it, it was written well, recorded over two years ago, two and a half years ago. So if you actually read into the lyrics, there's a lot about dystopia and uh, the elite um, cryptocurrencies, scarcity, basically, uh, you know, whoever has control of the water. I mean, what, what are the things we need the most now? Water, food, electricity, life without electricity. I mean, you can't buy the water food without your debit card these days. So whoever controls, you know, whatever's in demand, it's like that they can control the price and uh, basically control the world. So that's just a yeah. cryptocurrency, you know, Bitcoin is the most used one. So it has the most value. Once you have the digital dollar based on Ethereum, that'll have the most value because it's, you know, a major currency. The more it's traded, the more value it has. And then scarcity is in fact, is a very scarce album. <laughs> <laughs> it has more value because there's only 500 probably in existence. So, you know, wow. it was interesting to build on that. Um, what we have, what we need and what we don't need really. Hey, Where would be so, the best place to get scarcity? Um, you got to order direct from mission to entertainment.com. And um, they're in Europe. They have a uh, cortex records took a few. So just to save people shipping. And uh, I don't, I think, there probably weren't enough orders to even warrant pressing CD. So there's no CD at the moment. It's just vinyl and merch direct through them. Um, I'm sure they sent some out to like your, if there is a local record store in your town. Yeah. Well, that's it. I wish it was there in Tower Records. Yeah. Bob's. 
you know. We, yeah, we had a record store right in town, man. That got for some reason. Well, that went on, that went under, which I guess ago. no surprise. But sadly, what replaced it was yet another hair salon. We have like five hair salons in our town. For <laughs> Nail time. salons and hair salons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, yeah. dude, what? There's no way that all these guys are doing great business. It's like just to have two, maybe one. It's just it's like yeah. got rid of my favorite record out. store for it. It's like that's where I got my first CD was that record store. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Boom. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, we had a few. There's one here called Zia Records. And uh, it's interesting. I don't know how it works. What do they do? Order something that someone requests? Or, um, I mean, you might as well just order it direct from the label and the band these days. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, at least you guys are from, uh, I mean, Vegas was limited in record stores. We had actually some good ones. I find, okay, Aces Records, for example, they had a badass record store in Tampa, Florida. And look at how many badass bands they had because of it. So if you had access to that kind of the right kind of music at the right time where you're picking up instruments and you're still in high school, that's what, you know, created some amazing bands. And like oh, yeah. Vegas had a record gallery and we had Odyssey Records and then we had Underground Records, which was like a more punk. And uh, but then you go to L.A. and you're like, oh, my God. God, everything known to man, all the imports, everything, you know. So it was like yeah, really you get the bigger cool. cities that had the better record stores, and then hence bigger shows when bands played there, and then um a handful of actually quality bands because they had access to the good shit. You know, yeah. and then over the years, you know, then you find bands coming out of like stranger cities, you know, which is interesting, but they got it somehow because you gotta know, you gotta search for it, and now it's in your face. There's just too much choice, you know. Oh, yeah. That's why I've been kind of saying, especially me. Maybe I'm not picky enough, but I'm like, I kind of, another great problem to have. Too much good music sometimes for me. I keep finding stuff I'm like, I'm like, fuck. Like, it's like, man, I don't have a lot going on, but I still don't even have enough time to listen to all this fucking music. <laughs> like, yeah, dude, it's no, crazy. I, I, yeah, I got to the point where I'm like, if something's good, it'll come to me. Yeah. Like, really? What's all the fuss about this band? And I'll just, you know, I'll be like, nails. So like, oh, shit. Yeah, cool. <laughs> they're sick. <laughs> you know, when a band makes it on the cover, of Decibel, or someone just keeps talking about this band, I'm like, "What was it? Um, Coffin Raiders or something?" I'm like, "Okay." Or what, what was it? Um, Power Trip is always on tour with these bands. What is it? And then I'll be like, "Okay." Municipal Waste. So I was like, "Yeah, okay, I get it." Check it out. <laughs> but they work their ass off to get to that point. It's not just yeah. you put out a killer record. They tour and tour and tour. So it's fuck yeah. That's a labor of love, man. So it'll find its way to me. I mean, I, I at these days, I mean, I've always kind of got my inspiration from different kinds of music. Call it whatever, even the 90s alternative, whatever. But like modern, yeah. I'll, let, I'll just whatever's on the radio. And I'll be like, that's fucking killer. Who is this? And I'll be like, oh, 24K. Why? Always on the move. Whatever. And I'll be like, <laughs> I like it. What is it? And I'm like, okay. Oh, yeah. There's only, they only have two good songs. Deftones I heard on the radio the first time. And I was like. Oh, dude, you know, I love <laughs> my own summer or whatever. Um, but yeah, it comes to you. And then these bands work it and go. But the, the pop music stuff, I'm tripping out because you'll hear standard rock songs, but it's all electronic drums all with hip hop beats or whatever. So it's it's very rare to hear a real drum on the radio anymore. Yeah. So, and or even in metal, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they all get they, they all get sampled over and it's yeah. just like, it's all perfect. It's like, Oh, I think I heard, you know, messing with a few drum packs. I'm like, oh, I think I heard this sound on a, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite records. Like, oh, great. <laughs> it's like, shit. Drummer snare. There's an easy drummer snare. Clap. Anyways. <laughs> but the good thing about pop music is that they're, you know, I mean, everyone, it's the same thing, dude. They're, they have these sound packs and that they've got whatever. I can't even remember. Omnisphere or whatever. I mean, that's dated now. And then there's this new thing where you could tweak it. and whatever. But at the end of the day, you get these bands, like, okay, artists and producers that, they would bite your fucking hand off to have a real drummer to play on something or a real guitar. It's like, you know, they got guitar samples and stuff, but for someone to play and write, I mean, they still, they love the organic stuff too. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Well, yeah, there's some, uh, there was some like rappers or whatever where I saw like they perform with a live drummer and I'm like, this is the most awesome thing ever. But when they go on tour, they don't do it because it's cheaper to, well, they sell out Madison Square Garden with just the guy just on stage with a bunch of lights. It's like, yeah, it must be a lot cheaper than bringing a whole band, but it's, yeah. Bro, the few times I've seen, I'm like, oh my god, more like, yeah, like you said, live music. It's like, damn, it's really good. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, who is it? Twenty One Pilots. I mean, they got the drummer aspect, which is badass. And who else? Yeah. I had free tickets to go see The Weekend, and I was like, oh really? And I hadn't heard them before, and I was like, 
wow. Uh, yeah, an and, and they had the full yeah. band set up, whether they're plugged in or not. People, when they go to see a show, they want to see live music or at least some kind of dance freaking gimmick or whatever. <laughs> I went to see Ariana Grande with my daughter, and I was like, I mean, I love Rihanna. Like, Diamonds is, like, to me, awesome. So, but, and I'm like, I don't know what it is about her. Okay, she's a good singer, this Ariana Grande, and she's got range from hell and stuff. And I'm like, the song, it just doesn't, it didn't really click with me, but I went to see him and I was like, with the dance and stuff, I'm like, okay. There's a hit song every four songs. And I was like, and the song is three minutes and 30 seconds. And every four songs, there's like a really good song. And I was like, okay. Trying to anticipate the end, man. I was like, okay. But then other things, I went to see Imagine Dragon. And Imagine Dragons and when they played Radioactive, which was the song that was most overplayed. And then I saw the singer playing with live drums and stuff, you know, like uh, Tom's whatever, tribal and singing. I was like, that's freaking powerful. So the only two shows I really saw that I liked was them, Imagine Dragons and Dillinger Escape Plan. Obituary was amazing <laughs> as always. And it's like, show me something new. And that people like, that is like innovative, cutting edge, and sticks in your head love it or hate it, any kind of music, it's like, that inspires me, you know? It's like, I know when I put my guitar tone to something, it could be a rhythm or timing or pattern that inspired me. You never know where it came from, but I'm not ripping it off, but there's just, I don't know. I don't like just, uh, I feel I'm feeling a little bit of creator today. <laughs> you know, like, okay, I've been there, dude, for 30 years. Yeah. Do something that uh, pushes the boundaries a little bit, you know? So the EP is more like that a little bit not poppy but sounds that uh made it more modern actually nice. cool and uh, with real drums real instruments <sighs> that's what i like to hear yeah. well that, that, that's interesting like some bands i saw like uh one band that's like kind of popping right now it's a uh, spirit box have you ever heard of them uh they just uh, they started like releasing a lot of singles and whatnot and they they got a producer they like started a lot more like technical i'd say their music was yeah. and uh their producer they got was like a pop producer and he kind of like got them to like not simple like simplify it but then like they still have like the technical aspect but it's like the last like four or five singles they like they released i'm like what the fuck like it's just like a world difference where the music before was really really good but i'm like now i'm like holy shit <laughs> yeah I, I personally i love singles i wish every band had an album full of singles oh, that's I'm just gonna, sorry i'm taking no spirit box i want to check it out but uh but you know, unfortunately, a lot of times you get the single, the one that's most overplayed, and it's like the one you skip right past as well. You know, yeah. as you get, you know, it's the first one you burn out on. But if you get a single that stays with you for life, and you remember the first time you heard it, and who was with you, and you know, that's what music's all about. It creates memories. And as much enthusiasm as I saw for the new Napalm, that throws a joy. Um, as it was like, wow, everyone had it for at first for a while, but now I find everyone's going through the discography, like their favorite record is this or debate versus these four albums or what was your first, make your favorite set list. So they're, it's associated with finer times, dude. When we were young with no, with no responsibility or good, getting through hard times, when you hear that music, it takes you back. And, uh, and throws the joy. We'll also remember the pandemic time and like, you know, somehow yeah, yeah. It's through, but it's like people are binging on Netflix, you know, three series in a row until you're out of stuff. It's like, what are people doing? <laughs> or like in entertainment these days because there's nothing new but tons of new music that nobody seems to care about Dude, but it's, oh, a, it's a so shame you guys are doing the labor you're spreading the word yeah trying yeah at least because yeah. it's an honor to talk to guys like you and the people that we've talked to it's just like you know it's a joy for us because well we've just been lifelong fans of music you know we made made fun of in uh middle school high school about yeah. liking us uh, screaming <laughs> and all this heavy stuff and I don't give a fuck. It was really cool <laughs> talking to all these like cool people. You know, yeah, and I all say these people it's a fad. You grow out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, metal is, dead. Yeah, metal is dying. What in the '90s? But truth is, everyone will always love that standard rock and roll formula. I, I can't stand that word rock and roll, but you know, guitar, bass, drums, and vocals. Yeah, and even in modern music or whatever, that's still basically the same thing. People appreciate it a lot. No matter, you know, I mean, I love Prodigy and Pendulum and, you know, keyboard sounds and electronic EDM, whatever you call it, Aphex Twin, Square Pusher. But, you know, live, it's like they always had a band. It's like it's that traditional formula. And, uh, you know, and if there's actually right, sometimes it's a one man band like Nine Inch Nails, but then yeah. live, it's got the band. And it's like it'll always be there in different forms. 
that's it. Oh, it's yeah. good day, whether it's heavy guitar or not. Personally, heavy guitar bothers me. As uh, my guitar sound, um, when I'm working with sounds, say I put together this whole electronic song and I'm like, yep, and I got vocals, everything mapped out, pretty vocals, clean vocals, whatever, scream, whatever. As soon as I put my guitar sound on, which I love, I have developed what I'm into, like that's my tone, all these sounds disappear, man. Yeah, it just, just takes everything. You can't off. hear that nice nuance of the keyboard part or whatever. You got to distort it and crank it, and the drums disappear, and you can't hear that. Now that killer kick drum sounds like a really bad easy drummer trigger or something so it's like limiting so i would use guitar for dynamics like for an impact this is the part where it goes bang could be one stupid simple chord that just makes feel like you know something happened <laughs> so it, it has its uses but you know for me less is more in some places when you're working with building new sounds you know different like it, it's always been hard to get a clean guitar sound with the pickups in my guitar I was like obsessed with how do I get a clean sound? Like, what is it, a Fender Strat or a Telecaster or what? How do these guys do it? I love that clean sound. What do I need? It doesn't sound right through the Mesa Boogie. Oh, you need a Fender Strat or a Fender Twin. I'm like, okay. I'll try yeah, that. Well, it's also fine because you probably spent a lot of your life getting, you know, getting the, the more aggressive tone. And then it's yeah. like now you're more into like this, like lighter or like whatever of these different tones. You're like, fuck, now I got to put that just that same amount of time into getting this whole different tone it's like shit yeah. so no <laughs> yeah and to make it work from clean to heavy and uh also those chords that these guys know like I, I know nothing about theory or chords or whatever i could like try to figure out a kink song and be like what are these chords? or pink floyd to, to musicians i don't even consider myself a musician maybe more like a recording artist or whatever but it's like, oh, it's G E A B D D Q, whatever. <laughs> I'm like, I don't give a fuck. People showed me that Jesse once. He knew his chords, Jesse Pintado, and he's like, here's a chord book, fool. Learn your chords, because I love James and <laughs> Smashing Pumpkins back then and other stuff. All my Pink Floyd. Learn the chords. You got an acoustic? I was like, boring. I was like, put your finger here. Boring. Ew. Ew. What is this? And made <laughs> chord. And they came to some other things, and it said minor. I, I, I was like, oh, I know that. Oh, this is the one thing I play here. Oh, with an extra finger here. What is this? Oh, these are all minor chords. Oh, I like these. Okay. So that's tuned to E. It would be E minor, but we're tuned to C sharp. So then it's G sharp. Ah, fuck all that. I don't want to do the math. <laughs> oh, one, five, three, six. Oh, one, five, three, six. Everything but the dot. Yeah, that's my style. Yeah. And then so anyways, yeah. So now I'm finding myself having to learn chords, especially if I'm doing clean vocals that you're just singing and it's like, it's chromatic technically, but I'm like, I don't know. There's actually a scale. I mean, what's the scale? <laughs> okay, so we've come this far, 16, 17 records and I don't know nothing. And in fact, I think that that's actually helped us in a way where it's music by ear, you know, it's, it's a feeling thing and it's a rhythm thing and uh, some kind of connection that these musicians, like even like Steve Vai or Devin Townsend, for example, on Ingve Malmsteen asked once to produce our record with when Barney did an interview. And I'm just like, and John Zorn and these musicians that see it as jazz or, or what, but they can listen through and say, that's an augmented fifth, seventh, ninth or something. But it's like, we just did a yellow pages style. Like let your fingers do the walking. And <laughs> there is a terminology. I, I looked on TuneBat, this thing. I, I came across it and I was like, oh, let's put, see if Napalm's in there. There was like 60 Napalm songs. And it's like, it says B major. What, the wolf I feed is B major? <laughs> I hate major chords. But I'm like, okay, dude, maybe the opening, what is it, an algorithm that figures it out? I was like, that's fucking funny. So for the children is whatever. I was like, really, it's all based on a semitone scale. The most evil notes ever made or whatever. Um, I don't know. I love it. But with a clean thing and you're doing chords, I mean, I still put my fingers wherever. It's usually some sort of diminished, nasty something but i like <laughs> stuff too and someone said oh so there is something in it i'm kind of delving into it because it'll help with vocals yeah yeah i so you know trying to i don't know when you get the, the magic off note then it, it works that's why i love death tones i think yeah. they work in a similar way that it's yeah. just it is what it be <sighs> yeah dude also can't get enough death tones ever <laughs> i don't care how long i listen i'm like damn but yeah, I tried to do the same thing. You know, I play a little drums and I tried to how many times to learn guitar and every single time I tried to learn like theory and stuff. I'm like, oh my God, like drums, you hit shit. You could suck for like two years and just hit stuff. And then eventually you just figure it out and finally start playing in time and stuff. But it's like, 
Yeah. It's like man guitar. I'm like, oh, I gotta like figure it out. And I'm just like, man, everything I'm playing sounds like shit. I'm like this. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. I'm like the weird it's... thing about once. Okay, so I wrote like even back to Righteous Pigs. I hope you die in a hotel fire. I was like, okay, I don't know. It's a weird timing. I've always loved Led Zeppelin, and they do threes or three and a half, which is a seven or what these off time Soundgarden had it or whatever. And I was like writing these parts, which drummers would look at me like if it wasn't four, four, they didn't know. And I would be like, it's something like this. But then years later, still trying to perfect that off time thing or master it or whatever. And then it, it winds up being a seven or an 11, which is cool until you try to sing over it. But at the end of the day, I know the part and then I have to program it on the drums machine and and it's all math and it's like especially you got to say it's you know you set the timing and the amount and what and i'm like oh so before you know it it's you're dealing with these uh drum maps basically that are the dots or whatever so you can read you know drummers could look at it and read and know where the timing is but oh, so yeah. i learned the math part i'm like oh it's a three or it's three four or it's three eight or what you know just by programming so that was educational so you can still hit the drums but you know you have to explain it to somebody that is you know that's just straight up fool sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and or like this is weird yes that's right it's a three four and they just know and it, so it, it helps it's like this is a polyrhythm my friend showed me i was like man my sugar do everything with polyrhythm <laughs> which is killer and it's worked for vocals like fucking it winds up being blind eye vocal pattern you don't think about it but it's natural you know like what's the tempo of the, the average human heart there's a 90 89 or whatever it's like and which is also based on three, four. That's why three is interesting because it's 90 threes out of nine. And I'm like, oh shit. So let's do 180 tempo. And it's like, mm, that's a bit too slow. But what, when I start looking into the numbers, there is a theory behind it, actually, the concept of like a human heart. And if you're exercising, you know, the tempo of that track, it's going to push it a little harder. Or, you know, this is more like chill and, you know. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, especially when you even just walking down, you know, like before the pandemic, I was working in the city and, Hell, just walking down the sidewalk, man. If you got a fast song, you just like you just randomly find yourself walking on the beat. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I'm not trying to do that. Like, I'm, me and my own little movie, as I'm like walking to like the background. So I was like, no, I'm not. I'm still like, why would I do this? And <laughs> when you walk slow, people are getting pissed. Uh, when you have a slow song, because people are getting pissed. Like, oh, I'm just inherently trying to follow the song. So you're almost making like, actually, your feet are almost making polyrims over the song. If you're trying to walk fast to a slow song, you're like, wait a minute. Now I'm just like, now I'm all messed up mentally. Wait, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, when I walk, actually, whatever tempo it is, um, I find myself tapping on my legs to the whatever pattern my feet are making. I'm always making drum beats somewhere. Oh, that's awesome. At every light, with or without an indicator, every time I got oh, this, yeah. there's always a song in my head. My kids are like, well, why are you always tapping? I'm like, believe it or not, there's a the song that I've been working on is haunting me, three or four at the same time, so usually vocals these days. And I'm like, just, I got 60 different ways that the drums could go. But you'll never hear it because it's going to have that R&B hip hop sound too. I'll probably say, Derek, just, you know what to do, dude. Just, <laughs> I don't got it. You know, I want to keep all the essence of the sounds. Yeah. Just, just do your thing. Dude, that'd be awesome to have a guy like just, yeah, again, having a guy like that in your back pocket. So cool. Just like figure it out. You got it. <laughs> just yeah. no explanation needed. Yeah. Yeah. We were, when we were working together, somehow I accidentally, uh, when the iTunes player and my computer just switched to this other song that was in there. What's that? I was like, oh, dude, I've been working on that since 1999. I got like 60 songs on my uh, <laughs> eBay stuff, all the electronic stuff that I played on my groove box. He's like, oh, I was like, oh, wait, hey, check this one out there. And he's like, oh, man, I want to do something on this at some point. So he's seriously open minded. It's not just about metal. I mean, that's the, the essence of any musician should have that. If you know, if you know, if you found your thing and it's just guitar and that's all you want to do, that's that's great too. But you reach a point where, yeah, you know, that's like your mind is just just overactive. You want to do other shit, you know? Will you get a chance to do it? Will you have the balls to do it? And will anyone ever listen to it if they know it's you? <laughs> <laughs> have that that's not what I'm for. Yeah. Well, just <laughs> speaking about yeah. your your vocals in general, I think you did like a phenomenal job on this record. I heard so many different types of, you know, the highs, their lows. Like you sounded like Lemmy on some tracks. I heard like yeah. sound like Troy from Mastodon. Uh, there's the Fear Factory kind of like um, when you track your vocals for the clean parts. Like I I was just I was like holy shit. <laughs> like I was not expecting that throughout the whole record. You know, usually you hear like one type of vocal or one type of high or low. You had multiple highs, and multiple lows. 
Thank you. Well, I mean, I've been kind of working on that cleaner vocal style since the Wolf I Feed and then the Menace Impact Velocity album. Um, I mean, a lot of people compare it to Fear Factory and uh, it's funny when I saw Bird, I'm like, dude, everyone says it sounds like Fear Factory. He's like, what? <laughs> minute, dude. He's like, dude, 10 points for doing that. He said, it sounds nothing like Fear Factory. I'm like, there's not a, it's, when they say it sounds like that, I take it, not personally, but like, what, you mean they have a part that's like that? I mean, it's clean vocals. I mean, there's been clean vocals <laughs> since like, you know, Black Sabbath and <laughs> Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and Michael Jackson and, you know, but because it has heavy guitar on it, it's like people just can compare it to that. You know, I get it. I don't take it personally. I'm like, I, I think I know which part you mean. Well, clean vocals were one way and then Fear Factory <laughs> happened and they were another. You know, <laughs> changed the whole game. I mean, everyone's so the common fear factor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we've been doing music for years and years. And it's like, you know, I started singing later because we always had singers, you know, that had a distinct yeah. voice. And I'm like, well, the more I added to the live show of doing vocals, I'm like, okay, I think there's another voice in there that I like to try. But, you know, Barney already has that cover. So what's the point? What's the point of doing a Brave the Cold? album if it sounds even similar to napalm and i'm debating which band to use it from and Shane saying i want to use that one i'm like well i wanted to use that for my other. it's like it's kind of pointless yeah. so when it got to the point where i'm not touring with them i was like i guess i might as well do my own thing and you know i'm not sure if i'd be comfortable with them touring all my material with that it's like my baby it gets, yeah. you, you get really yeah. attached to your stuff and there's a vision you want to expand on which doesn't always roll with people and you know you just got to do your own shit and thankfully, Dirk was like, I'd send him a track. I did some vocals. He was like, oh, wow, cool job. I didn't expect that. Or like, yeah. <laughs> There's one song we did we probably won't release because it'll, it's just too far removed, actually. I was like, I don't know. It just doesn't fit. It's, it was the odd one out. It was the first one I did vocals on. Because I'm like, I don't know. And it, it opened the door to other things. I was like, yeah, we'll see. Do we have yet another side project coming for just <laughs> for, for more no, songs? I'll probably just hold on to this one. Really yeah. Rather nobody hear it except for super fans that would appreciate it. But do you have a, like a lot of that stuff, like a vault almost of just stuff you're like, this is like you keep close to your chest? Yeah, I have a new band I've been working on, which no one will ever know it's me. I mean, you might recognize my voice, but. It's not about that. If it would have too many expectations, it would just be so stupid to limit this yeah. thing. Like, oh, another side project from Mitch from Napalm Death. <laughs> Come on, man! It's like it's some, I, you have more potential as being an unknown. I mean, look at what Slipknot's done and and Bruinia that nobody knew. Whatever. It's like you know the mystery of the ghost or the, you know. Come on. Yeah. Give it a chance. Like just hear it face value as a song. Instead yeah. of expectations are like, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah, especially with metal and like, well, metal is very specifically, I don't know of how it is in like punk or like hardcore, but well, no, it's in hardcore too. It's just like you have a very defined sound in your head. Metal is very much like, oh, is it like hard enough? Is it technical enough? Like, if yeah. it's like, like, you know, in other genres, it's just like how many bands we talk to or how many times I see in like comment sections of like when I'm like checking out music and I'm just like, like, I don't care. It's like, oh, this guy didn't scream enough. It's like, well, he's got a really nice singing voice. I want him to sing more. It's it wasn't like, fast it's like, enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like not. Yeah, thrash metal bands basically get killed by thrash metal fans. Is it fast enough? It's like, it sound really good. Like, <laughs> it's, I don't know why it has to be faster. It sounds it, good right where it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it. Um. I mean, I, you know, no disrespect. I mean, people are how they are, and you know, you have expectations and limitations. But yeah. most, most people are open-minded, man. Yeah. I mean, we're we're big boys now, you know, we know artists have to follow their hearts and people would appreciate it. There's probably 10% of that community that would have really appreciated even more to say, like, oh, wow, the variation of his skills or whatever. Who gives a fuck? It's like, yeah, man, <laughs> um, I want it on the radio. It's stuck in my head. I want it to be on yours. I want it to be stuck in your freaking head when you're at the dollar store, freaking annoying you to the sleep to the point you hate the song. And then you catch yourself turning it up one day by mistake. You're like, oh, this song. And you go, oh, it's that. Uh-oh, you got me. <laughs> We've never had radio, dude, or MTV. You know, we had Headbangers Ball and metal shows. Yeah. Mainstream radio. I mean, there's a whole corporate machine that gets that stuff on there, in your face, in the commercials, on the ad. You know, to the point where it's freaking annoying. But, you know, it's a jingle. It sticks in your head. It's like, 
if it doesn't reach the right people, then what's the fucking point? I'm, I'm done with these half-assed things that come out, you know, reaches 500 people and it's, you know, disputed. And 10 years later, they kind of say, you know, I really love that album. Actually, It's like, well, it takes a lot of time and a little bit of money. And it's like, it's not reaching yeah. people. What's the point? Yeah. So I'd rather just work on it and see what happens. And, uh, you know. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as a, as a person that love, I don't know what it is. I love listening to the same thing over and over again. So like, I torture people with songs like that. Will get stuck in my head, and I'm just sitting there happily just humming it. Just tapping. They get stuck. They get stuck in that guy's head below. And just like he's like, "Fuck, I don't want to listen <laughs> to this." Song. It's like, no. Yeah. I'm like, sorry, bro, you're in my realm now. I'm sitting here listening to the same song over and over again. I'm like, I'm like, I can't get enough. I, I love that. That's my favorite part about music, man. When you find that one song or one album that you can just like play over, it's like. Well, for me personally, that's how like, I'm like, oh my god. Me too. That's yeah. how I choose the songs that I record at that point in whatever album I'm working on. Is I find for some reason running water. I mean, that's why people sing in the shower. But if I'm doing the dishes, some there's some motion, and there's always a song stuck in a riff or something, and I'd be like, it's stuck in my head. Where is it though? Out of like 17 hours of stuff, and when I find it, and I'm like, oh. Oh, here's the part. Please <laughs> tell me there's some other parts that happened around it to make a song. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's the ones that stick in your head that you work on the most. And, and in fact, they'll haunt me until it's done and I'm satisfied with the production and then I can move on. But I can't move on. It's it's literally torture awesome. in my sleep until it's like, OK, I can live with it. <laughs> Not that I'm proud of it or I feel a sense of achievement. I can live with that. And you move on. I mean, what the fuck? You got to draw the line somewhere. No, that way. is a good way to choose. Yeah, <laughs> just like oh, these are all bang. Because sometimes, yeah, albums do have that where it's like ten songs and four or five of them are bangers, and then there's like these in between songs that are good, but you just those they skip over. And it's, when you run into albums that are just like you can hit play and just not even look at the your phone or the radio or anything, you're just like oh man, I yeah. live for that. Those are my favorite, man. <laughs> yeah, when it ends and you just know what the next part is going to end. And if you were I mean, sometimes I'm in a pub and I play it on Google Jukebox and it's not the same. You just know what song's coming next and it doesn't come. That's like, oh, that ball. Oh, yeah. You know, Irks, yeah. Uh, South of Heaven has that effect on me, actually. Everyone's <laughs> in blood, but my favorite is probably South of Heaven. That's great. It's awesome, dude. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i not a playlist guy. Yeah, I have that problem a lot. <laughs> I wish I was a playlist guy. I probably listen to a lot more music because, like you said, like, like a lot of good albums came out this year and I feel like I listen to them once or twice because my brain just locks onto something and I run in the direction, even if I have all this good stuff around me. And I found myself when I was thinking about like, what's my like top five of the year or whatever. I don't know. And I'm like, Oh my God, all these albums I've listened to one time. I'm like, well, cause I just lock onto one album and just, or two albums. I'm like, damn it. Why does my brain work like this? <laughs> like, it's like, if I had a playlist. I sink in. I mean, yeah. I'm the kind of guy that could tell him one or two listens. I know immediately if I like it or love it or yeah. not inspired. I never really hate it. But um, it takes time. Especially, it's one thing for musicians and other things for, like, you know, people that just are listen to love a certain style of music. It takes them five or ten listens to really choose yeah. their favorite songs or what. Oh, yeah. They give it time, which is awesome. But it, it takes time to sink in. And you got the one-minute attention span, so... As long oh, as you yeah. get past that, they give it a chance. So I think it's, I mean, you obviously have musical abilities as well as, you know, you really, you know, I find myself, I'll burn out on the record if I hear it too much, unless it has that very rare thing, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, well, it's very rare. Yeah, and when it does, dude, it's, it's I'll buy, I don't know. <laughs> I want to throw money at the wall. Just like, take it, please. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's when I go to the show and I'm like, I don't, like, five shirts i don't care just you guys need money. all the merch right now make another one of those <laughs> please for the love of god or something whatever powers out there oh look at that <laughs> oh, what dog dog. what's his oh, name two dogs oh, i got two. four oh. oh wow damn well mitch this is this is a great time uh thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this with us and talk we, we talked for a while now and you really gave us a great in insight to like how you work and everything and we greatly appreciate that Oh, it was awesome. It was a super honor, man. Thank you so much for giving us the time to talk to you. Right on. Same here, guys. I appreciate it. You make the most of this Christmas break. Uh, <laughs> I try. <laughs> spending time with family and friends, just spending more time with family and friends. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully ain't got shit to do. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to get busy too. You know, just make the most of it. It's the simple things that matter these days, man. 
and oh, yeah. uh, you know, avoid the news as much as possible. And uh, yeah, uh, I always feel like uh, when the news is on, I always have this joke. Uh, downstairs the tv's right in between the kitchen and the stairs i was like when there's a certain new like news channel or whatever on or something happened i feel like it's almost like walking near a nuclear reactor i come down the stairs and i just get weaker and i end up crawling by the kitchen i'm like oh my god i just can't like it's just the negativity or something i'm just like i don't know what it is this information i'm just like it's like it doesn't make sense what happened (laughs) i'll never forget it was like five in the morning after working on some stuff i'm like you know what i i want to see what's going on out there and i put the news on and it was this real dry point where like there was nothing to report there was no nothing nobody was anywhere they were all working from their basements and there was like no sports no crashes no nothing because everyone was at home i was like i got to see the newscasters flirting with each other at five in the morning (laughs) is it are they really flirting with each other right now i mean there's nothing else to do i mean it's like it's a romantic comedy now that's what the news became oh shit all right (laughs) definitely comedy value there (laughs) <laughs> we've been fed so much horseshit we forgot what bullshit tastes like it's <laughs> a pretty good saying <laughs> oh man that's oh, awesome man. well again thank you so much man thank you really man. appreciate it all right take care and have Be a great safe day. you too thank you you too thanks guys and welcome back to the metal teddy bear experience podcast right now this is your host chris we got jesse what's up dog Yo, what's what's up, dog? Arf, arf, bro. No, restart, <laughs> restart it, restart uh, it. That's awful. But anyway, <laughs> I want <laughs> a huge shout out to Mitch Harris from Napalm Death and his new project, Brave the Cold. Awesome dude. I can't believe he talked to us for that long and gave us so many good answers. Like nothing trailed off. Nothing was like half-assed. He gave us legit answers went to great detail and we got a great insight into how his mind works and he actually gave us a great like you know you you talk about bands how they produce their own stuff and mix their own stuff but you never actually hear the intricacies of what they try to do during the record unless it's like their own little like you know side off video on youtube that they post like a studio update or something like that but during an interview or podcast and stuff they never get that you know detailed with it and he did yeah I feel like that one, not that it, like we should be that versed in it per se, like, you know, as very, very much amateur musicians, you know, uh, and knowing like the basics of a lot of things be due to either trying it or having friends that are in bands that have done it or seen big bands do it. But I feel like there was almost like a, a barrier to entry, like where we got a lot of cool answers out of them. But I feel like if I just knew a little bit more, we could have, which actually we probably didn't even have enough time. So thank God, actually, maybe there was a barrier of knowledge there because if we opened up that can of like worms where we got into even more details about his recording process, I feel like there have been a lot of cool stories, but it would have got super technical. And I'm almost like curious, like where I'm like, ah, I just don't know enough. Like I know a little bit of theory. He does even like, you know, he said he like barely even like, he's just starting to learn theory, but like, and then some of the recording of, I tried to record my electric drums and shit. And I'm just like, fuck dude this guy knows so much it's fucking crazy like like yeah like literally and also cool thing too uh well actually no we did shannon and then uh oh yeah so technically we had one in between but we interviewed two fucking 50 fucking 50 year old like legends like dude and like (laughs) and almost opposite sides of the spectrum too like shannon very he's in heavier music but very much like hard blues. rock or like blues and stuff like it was his blues project but like you know he's known for godsmack right and godsmack is like a hard rock band could be like maybe an alternative metal i don't know like yeah i don't care about genres whatever but like and you got this other guy who's in like the muck over here that did everything like he just like like napalm Def is like the superhero of the underground like literally they've like he said like yeah. they did everything they've been around for so long they they're like one of the only bands that have no original members because of how long. <laughs> yeah, dude. Around. If you look on Wikipedia and you see their band like members and former members, it's like holy shit. You can make three three bands out of all of them. Yeah, I think they're. I think that's even illegal now. I'm pretty sure. Like literally, <laughs> you like. I thought there was a, a like a rule or somewhere that you had to have an like that, that was made later. They just happened to do it before. But like, you need an original member. I thought to like have the license. I don't fucking know. Because at a certain point, you're almost a cover band, right? If you just keep getting I mean, if you have the license and the legal team is on your side, I guess you're fine. Yeah, I don't, which maybe is nuts. Get all that. I always heard about Napalm Death. My brother would always tell me, I'm like, fuck, that's crazy. He's just like, just like how many different members? And, you know, he's a legend, super, super story. Like, 
experience to hell, it's nuts. Yeah, it was a complete honor. Well, I gotta say, if you guys have not checked out his his other album, it was uh he put out another project back in twenty fourteen called Menace, and the album's called Impact Velocity, and I highly recommend checking it out. If you actually were around back then when it came out, he got physical threats from Napalm Death fans saying because it's a progressive metal, progressive rock kind of record. It's really not like Napalm Death at all. So you actually got physical threats over. But I highly recommend checking that out, especially if you like his new album, um, Scar City with Brave the Cold. Like Dirk did a great job. And I, I'm just going to make a nice little recommendation right now. If you want like two really good songs to get you into the album, Start off with the, I mean, this is probably why it's the first track on the record, Blind Eye. That one is awesome. And the second track is Hallmark of Tyranny. Those two tracks should get you into the record. And they're they're the first two tracks, so that's probably why. (laughs) But those, to me, are the strongest. They're really good. And they show you both sides of the spectrum for this brand new album, Scarcity. Yeah, the album's a banger. Like, literally. um... Hey, put me to sleep. I'm Jesse. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> that I was uh, great. Uh, stretching now, fire stretch. But uh, we're gonna sum it up right now by just saying like, subscribe, follow us on Spotify, put ratings, reviews, whatever platform asks for that. Uh, descriptions, comment. Yeah, and also, what's that. your favorite song off the new like uh, you know call to action? But what's your favorite songs off the Brave the Cold record? What's your favorite songs if you go check out Menace? If you know Menace, let us know because like this guy's got a whole history. What's your favorite part of the interview? Because honestly, fuck man, if uh, people you know didn't have such lo- like slow like not slow uh, short attention spans, even I you know like have that. Uh, I would love to talk to that guy for like four hours, dude. Just yeah. fucking get that. Just feed that guy. Someone in the kitchen. Just give that guy food and, and water and sustenance to keep him on the couch long enough to just like empty out his brain. Because it's like, dude, just the one story of the one tour in Russia was nuts. Yeah, so like, yeah we did this. We, took the train, we went over here. This happened. I mean, he it showed us that. his cool tattoo. So. Yeah. I'm like, that's one tour. Again, the band's been around for fucking ever. <laughs> like, yeah, that's crazy. Like, and it's like, you know, and I appreciate guys being happy that we're like, you know, spreading the word, but dude, it's fucking honor, man. Just a fat kid in Jersey, dude. Why do I get to talk <laughs> to all these like amazing musicians with having almost like no talent? Like literally just get to talk to these amazing people. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. It's always fun talking to the heavyweights and, you know, hopefully uh, you guys will like what's coming up next. You won't be uh, saying it right now. We're going to keep you in suspense, so just look forward to that. But, Ozzy uh, Osbourne. <laughs> well, he's no <laughs> ordinary man. He's halfway down to this album. But uh, until next time, my friends, keep it real.